it looks like we have enough to start. So yeah. um, I guess we can go ahead and start. So it's 1.03 p.m. It's the it's October 21st. So October um, insurance committee. I will let Linda go ahead and do a roll call. Um, Amanda Cox. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> uh, very best is absent. Caroline Sudlow. She's muted. I know she's muted, but <laughs> do I have to hear her say she's here? Matt Myers. I think, I think so. Uh, Yes, Thank I agree you. you do. Let me go knock on her door again. <laughs> yeah, keep her in I'm, line. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, this is Matt. I'm obviously here, but I'm in no way a voting member, just right. know, more advisory. Some my mouth died, and I can't get anything done just this second. Okay. 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 Do you hear that? Thanks, her her, yeah. her mouth died. She's okay. trying to get a battery. Uh, Dwight Bandivet is absent. Okay. Um, Jay Michael here. Casey Stone here. Lisa Gerald. Lisa Gerald. I'm using the wrong mask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Linda McGinnis is here. Carter Pack. I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, Courtney Durrett. Here. Okay. Uh, Nikki Davis. Here. Uh, Randall Kenner. Here. Samantha Chittam. Here. And William Betty Burkhart. I'm here. Okay. And we have a quorum. Um, so let's move. I guess that was the first item on the agenda. The second item is the approval of the August 2020 insurance benefits um, committee minutes. Um, did everybody, I hope everybody got a copy of those when Linda sent them out. Since we're doing the Zoom call, we have to do. Um, I have to call. call again. Yeah. So, Linda, do you want to go ahead and start? Well, we have to have a motion, don't we? Oh yes, I'm it's moved. been. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm moved. Who who said that? Michael. Michael. Okay. I'll Thank second. you. And who said Randy? Yeah, Randy. Me. Okay, so Amanda, this is on the motion. Uh, no, I didn't, but I can. Well, no, we're voting. Yeah. Oh, You're voting on your approval <laughs> oh, of the motion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, <laughs> I yes. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Caroline Sadlow. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Dwight Vandevitt. Oh, is not here. J. Michael Pusier. Yes. Casey Stone. Yes. Lisa Stone. Lisa Gerald. Yeah. Linda McGinnis. Yes. Carter Pack. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, Courtney Durrett. Yes. Nikki Davis. Yes. Randall Kenner. Yes. Samantha Chittam. Yes. And William Burkhart. Yes. Okay. And Barry and Barry Best and Dwight Benavid are not here to vote. So 12, approval of the motion to approve the minutes. And so after that, we do any, um, any discussion, any, mm -hmm. no, all in favor? Is that where we have to do that still? I'm still remembered from the last Zoom meeting. I don't. We all say I, uh, any opposed, we have no, but then it was the discussion. Usually, no. You'll usually do the discussion after the motion and second. 
Yeah. Okay. But now that we've voted, the motion passes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> And that one was easy because everybody said yes. Um, third item on the agenda, presentation of employee self-service benefits, enrollment instructions. So hand that over to, to Stephanie. All right. <clears throat> Hopefully I've got this screen sharing thing down. So I'll pull up the enrollment instructions and just kind of go through it. It's really um, something that everybody gave really good feedback on and seems um pretty user friendly. The platform hasn't changed a lot, but hopefully this gives people something to go on if they've never enrolled or just get stuck somewhere and there's not help readily available. So let me share this. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so we, we basically stuck to just enrollment instructions and tried not to go in too much detail with also still giving pertinent information in areas where people typically get hung up um, since we do all of our enrollment online now. Um, it's just step one, you know, going to self-service, going through our website. We're really trying to increase the traffic to our website and, and encourage people to use that as, a, um, as our main platform of communication as we grow that and build that out and add more resources. Ideally, people would be able to go there to find everything that they need. So um, that was why we decided to go ahead and have people access self-service from there as well. Um, logging in, um, we didn't do a password reset this year, so, um, we realized the forgot your password button worked and, and wanted people to try that out. Um, it sends you a link with a, a reset uh, option or it sends you a hint to your current password, which would be the hint you put in when you made it. So we've had some success with people using that so far. Um, it, it would want you to change your password if it's been reset. And then we just go through and basically step by step go through each section of where to click. Um, we really tried to highlight it and make it as user friendly and readable as possible without it being 16 pages long too. So we just kind of shortened some of the instead of going through each little option we have here, we just kind of summarized all in this one step. And then in some of the steps um, down here, we've emphasized a little bit more to click on the circle because those are areas where people start to kind of hunt around and say, what do I click on? And they're clicking here and they're not clicking over here. So if you have people get hung up there and in this new system, it doesn't automatically show you all of this either. So I tried to highlight these little arrow arrows on the side to really show people click here first and then it'll open up this window and then you click here. So hopefully that's useful. Um, we've got adding dependents information in there. And then medical flex and life insurance is always an area that people get hung up when we help them in person. So we tried to really outline a little bit more in detail. So these last couple pages get a little bit more wordy than the first two, but um, still just highlighting where everything is and trying to keep it as simple as possible. Um, something that I'm really trying to emphasize because people don't, if they don't choose our benefits, they think they don't need to go in and decline, um, but we still need life insurance beneficiaries. That is something that our department updates every year. Um, it's uh, a great reminder for people because if they do it once and never look back at it, then a lot changes. And so it could be an ex-spouse, it could be an ex-somebody. Um, so we really encourage everybody to get in here and do it through ESS and that way it's, it's really the easiest way, but we do have forms if they're not able to. Um, so we tried to add a lot more information here because this is, this is one of the areas that people get hung up on. So um, it has, and then we also outlined the difference between contingent beneficiaries and primary because that is a, a point of confusion sometimes as well. Um, whenever people are saying, well, I don't want benefits and, you know, I don't need to go in there. 
if you all could just help encourage them to go in there and decline anyway, it also keeps us from having to continue to remind them. And so they don't keep getting those emails that you're not done with enrollment, you're not done with enrollment, you know, so that, and that also lets us know that people haven't just forgotten. And so, you know, we really push that last couple of weeks to make sure everybody's accounted for because we don't wanna assume they just don't want benefits because there are legitimately people that just forget. So by them declining, they're helping everybody know that they for sure don't want benefits, but then also able to do their beneficiaries. So then the last page is just a life insurance overview. Um, really the, this one area hangs people up probably the most because they don't know whether to enter the cost of the life insurance or the amount. So we really tried to highlight, do not enter the cost of coverage, just basically enter the amount that you want to elect. Um, and then we added the gym membership at the end uh, and then how to submit. So it's pretty, and then our contact information at the bottom for a first round, um, I think it turned out okay, but I'm open to feedback as we develop this. It's something I'd like to use throughout the year for new hires and everything too, just to have as a resource on our website in case anybody's not readily available for somebody. Does anybody have any questions specifically on it that I could go over? I thought it looked really good. Mm -hmm. I had some good feedback, so I appreciate everybody that responded or everybody that just confirmed that it, you know, it was something that was useful. So <clears throat> it's always a little stressful when your work is public and there's going to be scrutiny. So I was really pleased that it wasn't terrible. Well, I was glad it was there because um, I, I printed off colored copies of it and attached it to the benefits guide um, for each of our, our people so that they would have all the information they needed right there and at their fingertips. So thank you. Thank you. How is it going so far? I know it's only day three, but. Really well, actually. There's there's quite a few that have already enrolled. Um, I think we were over 500 already. So for day three, I think that was pretty good. Um, we're hoping to increase that tomorrow. We'll be um, out at EPW. So we've um, scheduled some appointments over there with those guys to help get them enrolled. But, you know, we're, we're really just trying to navigate the COVID landscape and be available, but also, you know, reach out and still, you know, make ourselves um, useful and, and still empower people and kind of work together and encourage departments to help each other. And we've actually, I'm really pleased to say we've had a lot of people that have said, oh, I, I told my friend, I already helped my friend. And so it's really nice to see us all kind of coming together um, as much as we realize this is our responsibility. I can't say enough how much I appreciate the extra effort that people are putting in to support us and, and help get everybody enrolled and just kind of, you know, acting like neighbors that way. So I appreciate it. Well, the less, I guess the less we we interact with other people, the better it is. So like we've got two people in the office who are not extremely computer literate. And I sat down and helped, you know, help them walk through it because they're usually ones that are downstairs and have an appointment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we really wanted to make ourselves available to um, people with more intense benefits questions, especially our, you know, almost 65 folks or people that might be coming onto Medicare and have those kind of questions. We really wanted to be available to everybody, but, you know, we're still, we're also kind of, hoping our kids don't get sick and that we can be here. So, I mean, when I say I appreciate everybody's input, I really mean it because it, it makes a world of difference for just our day to day. So. We're thankful you guys are coming to EPW because, you know, we have a lot of people that. Yeah. Appreciate your help. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And we may be able to make some more days available there. Um, we actually had a lot of success uh, enrolling parks already. So the, the, almost all of them are done. So some of the days that we uh, set aside for them, we may just go ahead and do walk-ins at EPW. So that's, that's on the horizon. I'm just kind of 
feeling it out. And it's really hard to commit to anything right now because, you know, if we set and say we're there, you know, somebody's going to get sick. So um, we're, we have some backup plans and some things, you know, to still be available, even if it's just us calling people, you know, we're really going to, we're going to babysit this enrollment this year, but I'm really pleased that it's gone the way that it has so far. So. Awesome. Um, the next thing on the agenda, if we want to move to it, the presentation of the life insurance changes, we have a new company and yes. some different options as far as coverage amounts, it looks like. Yes, and I actually, thought I pulled this up already, but I've got a little summary I'm going to go through. Um, I liked all this stuff on there too, Stephanie, and I know Lisa would appreciate this because she's used it a lot with like um, people at um, the sheriff's office all the information with the new carrier for like the accelerated death benefit and just things like that, that I think people don't know. And then like, if you've lost a loved one, they offer that, um, the assistance with like travel arrangements, all that stuff, like grief counseling. Um, I I like that it was there that you could just click on it from the life insurance. People might not. I did because I was wanting to see what it was. And I was like, this is so helpful. Um, a lot of good, collateral on there for people to look at. Okay, I've got this. So let me share my screen again here. Okay. Well, you've got the guide, so I won't pull the guide up necessarily. Um, It does outline the new table. We do have more offerings available, but I'm going to just touch on Symmetra really quick because I, we've had some um, really good I feel like interaction and customer service from them. Um, They gave us this little at a glance thing, just kind of about who they are. Um, Because Symmetra is not necessarily one of the names on the consumer side that we know, um, but they have been around. Um, It is a major corporation. They do retirement benefits, life. Um, They just typically do it on more of the employer side. So they are also our stop loss carrier. So that's the insurance that we carry for when we have claims that go over a certain amount. We use Symmetra currently as the insurance carrier for that. So they were in on this bid. Um, They came in extremely competitive. Um, They saved us uh, around $430,000 per year in annual premium savings just on the county side. So that is savings on the basic and um, AD&D life that we pay. And so we were really pleased with that. Um, That was quite a bit over the current contract. And even over the other bids, it was, it was upwards of over a hundred and something thousand that they, they were able to outbid everybody else. So we were, it was almost a no brainer, but we did look at everybody and they just kind of came in um, and that was with a four year guarantee. And then they paid out more on the AD and, or the accelerated death benefit. So the um, typically you got seventy five percent for the accelerated death, and they're offering eighty percent up front with that too. So there were a few nice little perks there. But I can send this to you all. Um, I don't think I've emailed this out yet, but I won't go through every little bit of it. It just is kind of an overview of who Symmetra is. And then we have the summary that they provided us, which is basically like a summary of our benefits. Um, The one thing to note about the maximum amount is they have given us the guaranteed issue amount of 300,000, but because we carry the two times basic life and the one or two times AD&D and and one and a half times basic, there's kind of a cap on how much above that we could go. So seven times annual earnings is actually really generous. Um, It's more than the industry standard. That's only gonna affect your people that make less than 43,000 a year. And so most of them don't typically elect 300,000 in life um, or uh, if they're at a certain age, if they're um, younger, they may want to, but we'll do some checking and communication on the back end when that goes through and kind of educate them. Um, this is on the website though. So hopefully people read through it. I don't think it'll be that many that won't be able to just go ahead and, and elect the maximum amount. Um, when we're looking at people that do choose, that's just the employee supplemental life. So what we did here was increments of 15,000, 
um, this this allows us to go from 15,000 at the minimum to 300,000 at the max. Um, the spouse and child life stayed the same, uh, same rates and everything, but the rates for the supplemental life actually decreased by about 2% across the board. So um, it was less even on the employee side. So Knox County had a savings and Knox County employees had a savings and had more options to choose for life insurance. So we were pretty, we were pretty pleased with the outcome of this, this RFP. Um, child life stayed the same. We don't do um, age reductions. Um, we're not gonna penalize you for getting older other than insurance goes up as it is. Um, eligibility is the same. Pretty much everything else is the same. Um, the major difference between this enrollment and usually is that they have offered us a true open enrollment. So this is like we're starting fresh. So what you had before doesn't matter. You can elect um, more than one step above what you had before just for this open enrollment period. Now, after it closes, if you didn't elect or say you elected 105,000, the next year you would only go up to 120,000 without doing the EOI form or the medical questionnaire. So after this open enrollment period, so it's kind of like when you're a new hire, your first 30 days or it's whatever you want to elect. So people can treat this as that. Um, it doesn't, it's not based off of your previous elections. And that's something I don't know if I've still gotten questions about, even though we've put it out there. So if you all can help kind of spread the word that if they want to increase their life insurance, now's the time to do it um, because they don't have to do that medical questionnaire during open enrollment. Um, after this, if they want to increase it later, even for like a life event or something, we would have to, we would have to evaluate it there and we could guide them on what they need. But for right now, it's a true open enrollment. Can I and, ask a question? Uh, yeah. I have to leave at 1.30 to go to a conference that they're, they are keeping track of who's there. So um, if I send out an email to all county employees in my office, I can simply say, if you want to increase your life insurance on your plan currently, you can do so at this point without going through any sort of health testing, correct? Yes. Okay. I'll definitely send that out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I probably rambled, but that's what we're trying to really um, emphasize is now's the time. This table is, you know, wide open for whatever you all want to choose, with the exception of that one limitation on the seven times your salary. So, um, but that's, it's hard to get into details like that without confusing people. So it's there. I think it's something we'll probably just manage on the back end and communicate with people. Um, and I don't think it'll be that many that it impacts. Um, so otherwise, this is just a true open enrollment. And that includes the spouse life too. So we had some people uh, last year who went from 10 to 30 and got knocked back to 20, you know, because they didn't do the EOI. But this year you could go um, any amount on the spouse life as well. Okay, you didn't ramble. I just wanted to make sure I was clear okay. before I sent out such an important email. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> Stephanie, I have a question. Yes. On the accelerated death benefit, I know that, that we know about it because we've had to deal with it and explain it to people, but some people may not understand exactly what it is. Can you go into a little bit of detail about what, what it is and when it would be used? Yes, so um, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked because it is, it's not something that people typically know about. Um, it's basically a, um, a, an additional benefit in, in this contract that if an employee is diagnosed as terminally ill, you can apply for an accelerated death benefit. So you say you're, you know, you've gotten a terminal diagnosis, you're on a hospice, you know, you know your life is coming to an end. You also know you have this life insurance policy. Um, most people in those situations have a ton of medical bills that have already piled up and, and they're making funeral arrangements or they would like to take care of their families ahead of time. So this allows them the option to do that. So they basically can apply through Symmetra, um, through our office, just let us know. And, and like I said, that pays out with this contract at 80%. So 80% of whatever your supplemental life is, is what they're gonna pay you out. 
And then you still have the other 20% that when you pass, you're eligible to submit a claim for, um, and that goes to your beneficiary. So you don't lose the other 20%. Um, you still get to file the claim on that or your beneficiary would file the claim on that. Um, but this goes directly to the employee upfront and it's, it's basically just 80% of their life insurance. And I apologize. I'm so cold. I'm shaking in here. So hopefully I don't look like a chihuahua on this video. <laughs> it's freezing in our office right now. Does that answer your question, Lisa? Yes. Um, I know that we've had a lot of people that have taken advantage of that and it has, it helps to make their last days less stressful when they yeah. know that they can take care of their family, that they know that, you know, their spouse has a reliable car to get back and forth to work, whatever. It just takes a lot of stress off of the person that's dying so that they can, you know, just take a little comfort in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people in those situations are, um, they're, they're making plans and they're, they're trying to pay those bills and um, they, a lot of them do not know this exists. So this is a, a huge benefit to carrying life insurance that's offered to us. Um, and it is something that, that we've started trying to also increase communication around because we've seen, you know, we've filed this and we've seen this happen and um, it makes a world of difference for people to get that money up front and be able to allocate it the way that they want before they pass. Um, because in some situations, say the beneficiaries haven't been updated um, or whatever, you know, things are challenged um, after the person passes, then this money goes into to probate court or wherever, and you end up fighting over it. And so this also gives them a little bit of peace of mind that they're doing what they intended to do with this money up front. And um, you forward us the um, this document that we're we're seeing on our screen from Symmetra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is on our website too. Um, it, okay. it should be on the life insurance. It is. Okay. Tiffany, one other thing that you might want to mention, and for anybody that is going to send information out um, to all employees about the supplemental life, when you go into the benefits enrollment tool in self-service and you select all of your options, you can select your coverage amount for supplemental life, but it does not include that premium in your, uh, your cost calculation per paycheck. Yeah, um, thank you. I, that's actually on my notes to bring up. Um, I uh, kind of put a little bit of communication in there. Uh, it's also one of those things you have to tactfully um, communicate or it just confuses people because they don't know what you mean. So right. I intend, as we keep sending out reminders and I appreciate that you've noticed that too um, and wanted to mention to you all that um, that is a limitation in munis that when our rates change, um, you can't future date life insurance premiums. And I was hoping it would not be the case with the 20, with the munis upgrade we just had, but it, it's still that way. So with our regular premiums in the system, they're in two different places. You have your insurance premiums and you have your life tables. The life tables are real time. So if I go in there now and put the current rates for this contract, it's gonna change everybody's rates right now. And then I would be able to show those rates during enrollment, but it would affect everybody's um, rates that are enrolling in 2020 as well. Um, without having to do additional deductions and, you know, confuse and add more to the system than we want to. So what we typically do is just exclude those rates from enrollment and try to communicate around the fact that that's the one thing that's not going to be included in your, um, in your confirmation page. And just, um, I'm telling people to refer to the table and the amount that you elected, and then you can manually add that in. These rates shouldn't change next year because we're going to have them for the next four years. So um, we should be able to put those in next year and that won't be the case, but it's just one of those weird munis limitations that we kind of work around and, and hope to communicate more around. So it's in the confirmation page, but it's one of those fine print things that a lot of people don't notice. So if you all can help kind of spread the word as you're, as you're helping people enroll as well, um, it's just really one of those 
strange things about Munis that we all love so much. <laughs> Stephanie, what about the age? Um, I can't remember how it works or doesn't work. Lisa, you might, uh, I'm not sure. Like if you went to that next age bracket, like right now, if you're not, but if you have a birthday, so some people might, um, I guess to touch on uh, what Michael was saying, but um, it might show you the rate, but it doesn't add it, what he was saying in the end. But like if it increased because you went, you aged up to that next age bracket. Does that make sense? So like it might show you the lower one now. Yeah. But come yeah. January 1, you're going to be that next. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm even wording that right. You might be able to. <laughs> it does, and it's hard to explain when you can't put the actual premiums in there. Um, we were able yeah. to explain last year during enrollment because um, it showed. And so it's a little bit difficult. Um, so people really, um, it, it really mattered whenever they were increasing from where they already had an election. It seemed like more than when they were just enrolling for the first time, because that's where they yeah. noticed how much it went up from the last year. Um, the It's based off of your age at the time that the Oh, I don't want to say it wrong. It's, it's yeah, I always forget. Too. <laughs> I know it's like, it's based off of your age at the time the payroll runs, but it depends on whenever you're enrolling. So the system automatically calculates it. Um, it's not as much of an issue this year as it will be to explain next year, whenever we have those in there and they think that they're still in that age bracket, but we're basically in 2020 looking at next year. So it's saying next year, you're going to be in the next age bracket where people tend to say, oh, well, I'm only 54. I'm in here now. Um, so if somebody, like you just said, if somebody um, selected it and they were going to be 55 next year, it would be your rate that it's giving you should be based off the age 55, correct? Is that what you yes. said? It okay. should be. And that's where, that's usually what trips people up because they'll say, wait a minute, I'm not in that next tax bracket, or they'll be looking at the rate for the 50 to 54 yeah. and thinking rolling in that. Um, but I think it's going to matter more when we have the rates in there and we re-enroll next year. And then we'll definitely have to explain it again. Be like, oh my gosh. And I think yeah. this year that first premium payment comes out, I want to say out of the last check of December, which ends the 25th, maybe. No, it should come out of your first check in January, which let me look at my cheat sheet. Oh, that does the payroll. I see it now. Yeah, we'll set the payroll dates to where it runs. It, you know, we have to coordinate that um, quite strategically with because we have two different payrolls, but we'll set those dates to where it comes out of the January 8th check. So you shouldn't pay any um, anything for your 2021 benefits until your first check in January. It's okay. the payroll dates are December 19th to January 1st or something like that. But these premiums won't actually come out of your check until that first check in January. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I just think there's going to be some of the population out there. My birthday falls in that last pay period. So <laughs> if I'm aging up, uh, I see. it would be even more confusing. Yeah, I'm not. I'm forever 29, so I don't have to worry about that. But for other people, that do, and if their birthday falls after they've done benefits enrollment, they're probably going to think, well, this is what I thought I signed up for. And this is what's coming out of my check. Yeah, so handle that case by case and roll on with it. They yeah. have an option then, don't they, Stephanie, to make changes to a lower um, amount to get a lower premium at that time? Oh, yeah. 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 Luckily that is something that we can, we can change after the fact. Um, it's a little different in rolling in it, you know, than it is when you have it and we're adjusting. We do quite a bit of work on the back end with life insurance. It's just one of those um, funky benefits that's never really clean and um, is, does have a lot of nuance to it. And especially when you have a system like Munis that has its own set of nuances. So I know Samantha feels my pain on that, but we do a lot of work on the back end. I'm actually hopeful that this year that will be less of a case because we do have um, an, a true open enrollment with life. And then we also, by doing the increments of 15,000, we were able to create limitations to where people can't just put any amount in there where previously people didn't really always follow the table and they'd just say, I want something that wasn't offered. Well, Munis would let them 
And so with this new system, we're actually able to create those limitations ourselves. And so they shouldn't be able to go under 15,000. They shouldn't be able to go over 300,000 and they shouldn't be able to pick any step in between that's not on the 15,000. So it was, just, it's kind of a nice, um, and I'm talking hundreds of people that do this. So it's really going to save us a lot of work on the back end. So then we'll be able to attend to the people that actually have kind of those age issues or the, my premium's not what I thought it was and, and we'll take care of them. Some of that went over my head a little bit. So when we encourage people who want to increase their life insurance during this true open enrollment, am I, what I am, is what I'm getting that the munis calculation will not be an accurate calculation of the, the premium going forward so that people could be surprised unless they pay attention? No, it's actually not going to calculate life in it at all. Okay. Um, because the alternative is counting it at the the current premiums, which, um, you know, it, it would, it would still be wrong. It would actually tell them they were getting more taken out than they were. So it wouldn't be terrible, but we try to be as accurate as we can. And, um, the lesser of those evils was just not calculating it in since it wasn't going to be accurate. Um, we like to make sure we're telling people what they're getting. And if we can't tell them exactly what they're getting, then, we just manually cal calculate that in later. So it shouldn't calculate your life into that confirmation page at all. It shouldn't show the, the amount that's, that's a setting in there that, that we put just to keep from any confusion um, with saying, well, it said I was going to have this taken out and that's not what it is. So we're just really trying to communicate around the fact that all of the deductions that when you get your summary page are in there, should be accurate with the exception of if you elected supplemental employee only life, you'll want to add that, that amount in manually, okay. but so, spouse yeah. didn't change child life didn't change. So those should, everything else should be in there. The only deduction that's not calculated in the final um, amount will be this employee supplemental life. Okay. Stephanie, didn't it show the amount for it? It just didn't add it. Cause I'm thinking when, when I chose mine, it showed me my amount, but I'm thinking it just didn't add it. Like Michael was saying in your, but I could be wrong. I was thinking I saw a dollar amount there, but I don't I think, be surprised. Um, I don't think the self-service tool knows how young you are. Um, <laughs> it, it goes basically off whatever you click and then it pulls the calculation down, but there's nothing calculated at all for the supplemental life. It, it's not showing you enter an amount and then it populates a box that shows you what you had in the previous year, the year we're in now, but it doesn't show you the new rate and it doesn't pull it over into the calculation. I was going to say mine. I was trying to share um, my screen so I could go down through there with you because I don't care if you all see what I'm electing, but it wouldn't let me share it. So. And this is, this is a new system. So any glitches or any kind of things like that, that, that do happen, I'm, I'm really hoping people let us know about um, because that's something that we work with Tyler on uh, to clean up and make sure that, you know, there, there have been more glitches than I can say. Um, luckily, everything went off with a hitch and we started open enrollment. <laughs> but, you know, with, with a computer upgrade, you just never know. And there are always those little speed bumps that you have to go through. So there have been some things that luckily came up before open enrollment happened and we were able to resolve so I wouldn't be surprised if it does something um, a little strange, but as far as I could tell when we tested it, it didn't show those amounts at all and it didn't calculate them in. You just were able to enter the dollar amounts or the, the amount of life that you wanted to elect. Could you refresh my recollection? Are these pre or post tax dollars? The life insurance benefit is post-tax, I believe. It is. $100, anything over $100,000, I believe, is all post-tax. The uh, medical and the um, flex spending and all that is typically what's pre-tax. They do the life insurance post-tax so that your beneficiary doesn't have to pay taxes on the money. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Does anybody else have questions or um, hopefully I gave a decent rundown. I, I'm exhausted. It's been a long 
four months <laughs> and uh, we're in full swing. So I'm, I'm not going to lie about that, but I definitely wanted to address anything with you all. Cause I know there there's, this is a, an interesting year. Um, there are definitely some changes and we're just trying to adjust and, and shape shift as we need to. So um, hopefully I've answered your questions, but you know, I'm always here if you all have anything outside of this as well. I do have one more thing. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, one of our people was uh, doing her um, benefit elections. And when she got down to supplemental life, um, she was absolutely certain that, um, you know, she's still in the same age bracket this year as she was in last year and she's electing pretty much the same coverage but the premium is higher and I understood from today that really we should have all seen like a two percent across the board decrease in premium do you have any idea why that that would show as an increase for her so she was able to see a premium amount. Is that what happened to you, Samantha? Is that what? Yeah, mine showed a premium amount, but I honestly, I kind of looked at the amounts and looked at my age and it looked similar. I did not match it up dollar to dollar. Maybe that was bad of me, but I was like, oh, it looks similar. Like I'm good. <laughs> well, if it does show, I can, I can say it's showing on the current rate so that it, it is going to be higher than, um, what it should be what you would see in this table um, because it should be two percent lower at least than what you know what you had last year if you're electing the exact same amount now if, she, if she's on the cusp of that age bracket um and it, if it went up significantly um those are the people that typically see the big difference are the ones that are turning you know um 55 60 65 um, because in those higher brackets, it's almost like the premium doubles when you go up just one step. Um, and I hate that. I really hate that because <laughs> that was the hardest thing about enrolling with people because it's hard enough to get old and then they charge you even more for it when you're just trying to get one, uh, you know, $15,000 more in life insurance because it almost doubles, but that's just kind of the nature of, of life insurance as it is. But um, I may just have to take a look at hers individually, Caroline. Um, my guess is she was seeing the current rates. If it is showing that, it's not supposed to because we've set it up to not show that, but I'm not surprised with anything with this computer upgrade. So I'll take a look at it and see what it's, you know, we'll test it and play around with it a little bit more. But um, my guess is she's either on the cusp of that and it's calculating next year at the next age bracket. Um, and she's seeing current rates. So that might be some of the confusion, but. I'm in there now you. and it, it shows your current, your future election. No, it shows um, your existing. And so when you flip back to that other screen, it goes back to existing somehow. It, it's not showing the new rate for me. Weird. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, and I don't elect this benefit. I played, tested around with it, but um, I have supplemental outside of here. So I haven't, I didn't enroll myself in it. So I appreciate the feedback. I'll check with Elizabeth and Corey too and see if they've had any feedback from people that have issues with it or anything. Um, but it is definitely one of the things that we just kind of we do a lot of work on the back end. So, you know, we'll make sure everybody's set up with what they're actually supposed to have. And I'm gonna go in and enter those new premiums before the first of the year, before the payroll runs. So they'll they'll be current by the time that first check goes. So if anybody has issues, you know, they can always reach out to us too and, and we'll make it right. Are those things you all wanna know about, Stephanie? Oh or yeah. No? Okay. Right. Like, so if, if they came to us, tell you that specific employee's name so you can research their specific. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm a QI person. I'm all about quality improvement, whatever we can do um, to make things better. If we don't know something's wrong, then we can't fix it. So 
um, any kind of feedback, I never take negatively, even if it's negative feedback, um, it will be put to good use somehow, whether it's even explaining the why behind it, because sometimes, you know, you get negative feedback, but then the minute you say, well, it's this way because of this, you know, people can accept that and move on. So I'd rather keep increasing communication around that and fixing those problems. So absolutely, you can never tell us too much um, because we're always going to take it and try to make things better, you know, and, and, and be doing, you know, the most accurate work and, and communication we can with people. Any other questions? No, we have a new member, Courtney. <laughs> nice to nice to have you on the board. Thank you. And I will kind of piggyback off that being a new member and being new to um, county employment and all that stuff. Since I did just complete all of the benefits information and everything like that. I do need to do it again for next year. Is that correct? Yep. Perfect question because we get that a lot. But yeah, um, any new hires? We actually have new hires that start um, after open enrollment starts. That's a, a main question they have. And so they'll do both. So one nice thing with this new system is we actually are able to do separate campaigns. So they can do a 2020 enrollment and they can do a 2021 open enrollment and it's all separate. And so it makes it, it makes our lives easier as well. But yes, definitely what we're doing now is for 2021. So you've enrolled in 2020 and then we re-enroll for next year. And this is the one time of the year that, you know, it's, it's open enrollment. I tell people embrace your, empower yourselves, um, make good decisions, make changes this year, especially I'm really trying to emphasize to people it might not be the same situation as last year. So, you know, people tend to just say, well, I just had that last year. I'll have that this year. But we're really encouraging people to reevaluate what's happening in your family and in your household. And, you know, people have different incomes now. They have different health situations. Mm -hmm. So really use this time to reevaluate and say, what do I need for next year and where are we currently at? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Welcome, Commissioner Durrett. Thank you. <clears throat> Are we good? Le, le, um, this this is Matt Myers. Linda, is there anything else on the agenda? Uh, no. Okay. I'd just like to take a moment and um, and thank Stephanie. Uh, I know she's kind of new to Knox County, um, being thrown in this and didn't have a whole lot of time to get things together but has done an absolute awesome job doing this. She's even called, we've had numerous conversations. She's somebody who wants to do it right, wants to do it correctly, doesn't want to make a mistake, doesn't want to you know, put the county in a position uh, that we shouldn't be in. So you know, over here on the procurement side, I applaud her for the way she's done this this year, the way she's conducted herself, and the numerous phone calls we've had, it's been, it's been welcome. And Stephanie, you've done an absolutely fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Oh my gosh, you're gonna make me cry on public record. Um, I can't say that it's been easy. Um, I'm actually not new to the county. I've been around for almost five years now. Um, I'm just newer to this side of the county. So I was a health department admin for over three years before I came over here. Yeah, um, so a different role. I apologize. That was incorrect. <laughs> different role. Yes, um, and it did. I. Uh, it's been a whirlwind. It, it is not what I expected when I came over, but I. Everything Matt said is is very accurate. I genuinely care about um, the people of Knox County. I care about um, doing the right thing and um, making good choices and being good stewards of. Um, this major responsibility, this is people's health care. And I'm a health care advocate. I, um, one of the things I love the most about this job is being able to have a voice as an employer. Um, that's the way the health care system is going. It's the only way we're going to make change. And so as employers, we're able to stand up with a self-funded plan and say, we have um, 
<laughs> Dwight's killing me. We have, um, you know, 5,000 lives that matter. And what are you going to do for us? And so there are employers across the country that are doing that. And it's really, really exciting to be a part of that, even as a small county government. Um, so that is an aspect of this job that people don't realize exists. But um, it is one of the most rewarding parts, um, other than serving Knox County employees. So thank you, Matt. Um, I choked back some tears there because it's been a, I'm a I'm a fighter, so I keep pushing through even when things don't always go right. But um, I'm definitely honored to be in this position and um, really going to continue working for you guys and and you know taking your input and taking your feedback and trying to put it to good use. Stephanie, let me say real quick too. Um, I know Commissioner Durrett now gets to enjoy it uh, as much as <laughs> Dwight and uh, and I and a couple of others. But you were in front of Commission. I think that was the August meeting. September. Was it September? They're all kind of running together now. But um, to to explain to Commission and and I thought it was valuable information for this uh, committee to know where you had saved the county a, a significant amount of money over the next few years. We've seen, it, it looks like when you go in and do your um, benefits enrollment, you everyone will see that the county's cost is, has gone down. Um, that life insurance cost has gone down. And at a time like that, like we're in now, that's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And I, I do appreciate your diligence in that and helping us control the cost both to the employee and on the employer side. Th this is a, a robust plan that we have when compared to a lot of private plans. And, and we discussed, you know, we ended up doing a, a, a premium increase, but actually the, the cost had been controlled and actually reduced. And um, since some of the people that are in this committee didn't get to hear you at commission, if you could just touch on that real quick, I would appreciate it and I know they will too. Yeah, so uh, we basically went over this life contract, which we've talked about the, you know, 426000 in savings for just the annual premiums by taking it out to bid and not continuing at the current rates. Um, but the Optum RX contract um, was something that we um, decided not to go out to bid with and just decided to negotiate with them um, a little harder for several reasons. Um, disruption was a major, major factor because when we would have normally went out to bid for that contract, um, we were experiencing COVID. It was, it was February. We were already, um, we had rumblings of, of shutdowns and um, potential supply chain shortages. And so we had no idea like the rest of the country what was going to happen. So the decision was made to um, go ahead and keep that contract as a renewal, but really push Optum and um, really press for a continued um, guaranteed savings. Um, we actually went back several rounds to the point I wanted that contract on agenda in August and it ended up in September um, because I called their bluff basically <laughs> and um, kept pushing some items that I really felt like were going to financially impact us in the long run and so we were successful in negotiating those out. Um, those contracts are extremely difficult to make sense of. Um, I am not alone in this fight. I'm not going to take all this credit. I'm just the one that's sitting in the seat now but that groundwork has been laid before me. Um, I hope it continues after me. Um, Pharmacy is the one of the greatest contributors to our cost. So it meant a huge deal for Optum to come back and say, we value you as a customer and we're willing to continue this and we're willing to give you these guarantees and we're, we're gonna come back with better pricing. And they did that. So um, we were happy to say it, it's right over, I can't remember the dollar amount. I may be able to pull it up now, but uh, it was about, it was a little over a million dollars a year over a three-year contract, so 3.3 something million over the course of the three years, um, just roughly. So, you know, we have inflation. Um, we're going to have increased pharmacy costs continue. So if nothing else, that's going to just keep us from 
spiking in an area um, such as pharmacy where we can at least keep our cost as flat as possible, um, which just means you all get to keep your costs as flat as possible. So that's the goal. Um, but that does take an, an, an immense amount of work and research and consulting to be able to um, really successfully negotiate those contracts. But like I said, I'm a healthcare advocate um, for the people. I'm all about making this system better. And um, if, if, we can, if we can get a handle on pharmacy, I think we'd all be better off. But I'm not gonna take all the credit for the success of this department because <laughs> there are plenty of people that came before me that laid that groundwork. And um, you know, I, I was just lucky to land here. I did not expect it to be what it is, but I'm really, really happy to say um, I'm able to use my education and my background to help Knox County continue to save money. So as long as they'll, they'll have me, then I'll be here. <clears throat> so thank you. Um. I think the next thing on the agenda, does anybody have anything for the next meeting? I know it's scheduled for Wednesday, the 11th, which is Veterans Day and we're supposed to be closed and off, but I didn't even know if there was anything anyone um, right now knew of that they wanted to. Do we have a claims analyst in your group, Stephanie? Mm -hmm. Or do we have a, like a third party that does claims analysis? Yeah, we do. We have a data warehouse um, that, that helps us um, uh, pull claims information and, and track all of that. And it's amazing. It's, they send us reports as needed and regularly. So um, we also have benefit advisors. Um, Trinity's our benefit advisor and they are really great at, even when I'm looking in other directions, sending me those trend reports and pulling me back in to focus on those things. So um, we definitely have some other groups that we rely on to, to keep track of all of this. Can you give us maybe, um, it, it doesn't have to be in one of these meetings, but can you give us maybe like a screenshot of 2020? Uh, it may not be of interest to anybody else. I was the claims analyst for the city of Knoxville and worked with Navigator MD and Healthcare 21 and Willis and all that. And I know a lot of it just doesn't mean much, but just so we can kind of get an idea of where we are claims spending wise and for the year. Yeah, I think Trinity already um, does that for us. So it should be really easy. Um, they just sent me a trend report. You know, we have a claims lag period. So what we're looking at now is obviously from you know sometimes six months ago or more so. Um, there's a little bit of that. It's one of the reasons it's really hard to say to the dollar amount how much we have in reserves, because in reality, with insurance, you mitigate risk and um, you you could say one day we have this much money and then the very next day you could get hit with two NICU babies and you don't have that much money. So that's one of the reasons right. we, you know, we don't drill down that far, but we can absolutely share trend reports with you all if, if interested. And Trinity's um, done a great job of pulling that for us and, and helping keep that on track for us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Was that the only thing and, or. Again, that doesn't have to be an agenda item. I don't, I don't want to have a meeting on veterans day just for that. <laughs> I hope not, because I'm going to be on a field trip with my daughter on Veterans Day. <laughs> I think we and my dad's a veteran, and I'm a military brat, so we celebrate that as a holiday around my family. We should consider not having a meeting in November. I second that. So, Lisa. So, Lisa, was that a motion? <laughs> yes, I'll make that motion, and okay. if there's nothing going on in December, I'm okay with that, too. Okay, and Michael, you were the second on that, right? Correct. Okay. You want to do a roll call vote, Linda? Yeah. Okay, so that was a motion just to cancel the November meeting, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Amanda is... Gone. 
Yeah, she's gone. Okay. Caroline? Um, yes, I. Okay. And Michael Pissier? Aye. Okay. Casey Stone? Aye. Lisa Gerald? Aye. Linda McGinnis? Aye. Carter Pack? Aye. Courtney Durrett? Aye. Nikki Davis? Uh, Randall Kenner? Okay, Samantha Chittam? Aye. And William Burkhart? Uh. Okay. Linda, I believe Dwight joined the meeting. Eight, oh, Dwight did? Oh, he did. did. Dwight, so. Aye. Aye. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> And Barry's not here, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's 10 to approve that motion. With that, I move to adjourn. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. <laughs> So are we good? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And we're coming to a close at 204. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.